in section 17.4, I'm going to discuss pendulums. A pendulum consists of a mass that's hung from a string, and the string needs to have a very small mass compared to the mass, and the mass is called a bob. Now, uh, we can find the period of a pendulum, and we're going to use T for period and a subscript of P to uh, distinguish it that it's a pendulum's period as, as opposed to the T sub SM from last section for the spring mass period. And uh, again, the period depends on the uh, properties of the system. In this case, the length of the, uh, the, length of the string and uh, the strength of gravity that, is, um, that the pendulum is experiencing. And uh, one really neat um, application of this is that you can use a pendulum to uh, very easily measure the value of G at any given location. Remember, G uh, we use a value of G for of 10, but G does not have a value of 10. It varies based on uh, local gravity. And uh, all you have to do is take a pendulum, set it going, find out how long it takes to uh, repeat. As long as you know the length, then the only missing variable here is G. So if you take a pendulum, measure the period, measure its length, you can measure uh, local gravitational strength. So in the uh, equation, uh, the L it's obviously stands for the length of the pendulum, and you need to be in units of meters there. G is the gravitational field strength. We're going to use a value of 10. It's important to note that the, uh, the equation for the period of a pendulum given on the last slide is really just an approximation. And it's an approximation because for a pendulum, the restoring force uh, that provides the acceleration is proportional to the sine of the angle. And when we're discussing a pendulum, we're, we're going to regard the angle as position. And uh, you should remember that from section 17.2, we discussed how uh, systems that show simple harmonic oscillation have the pattern where the acceleration depends on the uh, position, where they're directly proportional. And that's not true for a pendulum. However, the uh, angle is uh, is very close to the sine of the angle for small angles. This is what's called the small angle approximation. And this, by the way, only works if you're measuring the angle in radians. And so as long as we uh, look at the angle uh, as, as being a small angle of, of about less than 20 degrees, then the equation on the last slide will give very good results. Um, one, it'll only have a difference of about 2% uh, from uh, the prediction to the measured value. Once you start getting up to 30%, the error is going to grow to about 5%. And then once we get up to something like 70 degrees, we're looking at a difference of like 23%. So uh, as long as the angle is quite small, then the, um, then the period does not depend on the amplitude and it is, uh, it is matching the predicted value from the formula pretty closely. So what does and doesn't affect the period of a pendulum? Well, it does not depend on the mass of the bob. All pendulums of the same length will have the same period. It also doesn't depend on the amplitude as discussed on the last slide as long as we are looking at amplitudes that are small. However, it is dependent on the length of the pendulum, and it is uh, dependent on the strength of the gravitational field. So a pendulum of the same length would have a different period on Earth than it would on the moon. And as discussed before, if you know the length and the period of the pendulum, then you can use it to measure G at any given location. Here we're going to look at a uh, couple quick examples. In this first one, we have a child with a mass of 25 kilograms riding a swing. A swing is basically a pendulum. And you observe that the child swings back and forth four times in 14 seconds. Part A wants us to calculate the frequency of oscillation. That's going to tell us how many, how many uh, cycles the, uh, the, the pendulum 
uh, will oscillate through in some given amount of time. And so the frequency is going to be given by four cycles in 14 seconds, which would uh, simplify to 0 0.286 cycles per second. And a cycle per second is a hertz. If we wanted to find the period, period and frequency are reciprocals of each other. So I just have to take the reciprocal of the frequency. And that will give me the period as three and a half seconds. Remember, period is an amount of time, so it's measured in seconds. For part C, we want to know the, um, the length of the rope. And so we can use the period of a pendulum formula, where the period is 2 pi times the square root of the length over g. And I know the values of g, which is 10, and I know the value of the period. I just worked that out. And so we can uh, solve this for the length. Now, the first step in the algebra, since length is underneath the square root, the first step is going to be to square everything. So I get period squared. 2 squared is 4, pi squared, and then squaring the square root undoes the square root. This will give you L divided by G. And so uh, we can rearrange this for the length. You'll end up with a T squared. You got to multiply this by G to get L by itself. And then you have to divide each side by 4 pi squared. I know the values for T. And for G, and we can calculate the length as 3.1 meters. And Part D wants to uh, wants us to determine if a child with a mass of 50 kilograms would uh, riding the same sh uh, swing, uh, what the new pe uh, period would be for this pendulum. Well, as discussed on the last slide, the mass of a pendulum does not affect the period of the pendulum. So even by doubling the mass of the pendulum, the period would not be affected. And for our last example, here we have a student that is releasing a 2 kilogram bob from a 1.23 meter long pendulum from the position shown. And the question asks us to neglect loss. Part A wants us to find how long it takes for the bob to swing to its lowest position. Well, swinging from an end point to the lowest position, that is a quarter of a cycle. So the time that it will take will be a quarter of a period. And uh, we can work out the period with 2 pi times the square root of L over G. So this will simplify. If I simplify the quarter times 2 pi, that works out to be pi over 2. And then I have to multiply that by the square root of the length, which was given as 1.23. I'm going to divide that by G. I'm using a value of 10. And that gives me a value for the time of 0.55 seconds. Now, part B wants us to find the, uh, the, the height H above the lowest point of the Bob's Swing. So for that, we're going to need a little bit of, uh, a, of a diagram here. So I'm going to uh, take the length of the pendulum to be L, and we're looking for that distance H. And you can see here we have this triangle. Now this triangle will have uh, two sides that we're interested in, this side that I'll just call X, and this side that's the length of the pendulum. It's still the same length if it's uh, swung to the side. And uh, I can work out the value for x with cosine because x is the adjacent side to that 26 degree angle and L is the hypotenuse of that triangle. Rearranging for x, we get that value. And we uh, should be able to see that the uh, whole length L is going to be x plus h. And 
if I know that x is L cosine of 26 degrees, I can use this to solve for h. h will just be L minus L cosine 26 degrees. L was given as 1.23. And so the, uh, the maximum height above the bottom of the bob swing is going to be 0 0.124 meters. Using that, we can calculate the bob's speed at the lowest point, and we're going to do that using energy. The, at the end points, the bob has gravitational potential energy. And that gravitational potential energy it would have here gets converted into kinetic energy. So at the bottom, it's got all kinetic that it got from the gravity potential at the uh, endpoints. Kinetic energy expands out to be 1 half mv squared. GPE is mgh. And notice the mass of the bob is going to cancel out. I could calculate the energy in the system, but I don't need to. So half times that speed squared will be g, which is 10 times the height that we just determined was 1.24. If I rearrange for v squared and calculate, I get v squared is 2.48. And taking the square root, I'll get that maximum speed of 1.57 meters per second. And we're going to need that value to uh, do part D, where we're going to work out the tension of the string at the lowest point. At the lowest point of the um, pendulum's motion, we will have the tension force pulling up, and we'll have the weight force pulling down. And um, at that point... It is in circular motion. Do not make the mistake of saying that the tension is equal to the weight because it is not. It is not at rest at that point. It's in circular motion. So there has to be a larger force in towards the center of the circle than there is outwards uh, to provide what's known as a net centripetal force, which would be given by tension minus weight. And the uh, centripetal acceleration is given by speed. Uh, speed squared over r. The value of the weight we can work out using m times g or 2 times 10. The speed, remember we needed that value, 1.57 squared, and then the uh, radius of motion is going to be the same as the length of the pendulum, in this case 1.23 meters. And when we calculate the value for the tension, we end up getting 24 newtons, which is greater than the weight of 20 newtons.